Lord, we're grateful that um, you love us and you've loved us before the foundation of the world. We're thankful, Lord, that uh, we're not like servants, but we are, we're children and you let us know uh, what's in your heart and, and, and uh, through the Holy Spirit you open up truth to us, Lord, which, is, um, which gives us insight into your workings in the world. And Father, we pray as we go through these sessions that um, your Holy Spirit would give us eyes to see and ears to hear and hearts to accept that which is from you. For we pray this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. In this first session, we're going to be looking at really a a series of signs of the end times. This whole conference is going to be about signs of the ends. And of course, uh, in the sessions that we've set aside here, we couldn't possibly exhaust that topic. So we're recognizing that there may be uh, many versions of this in the future as we think of other things that we should be addressing. But when we consider the end times, of course, what does the Bible have to say about the end times? And are we given signs that indicate this period is approaching or is upon us now? It really is not a very popular topic in many churches, sadly, today. They would rather uh, concern themselves with things that are more of a temporal uh, nature when, in fact, the Bible uh, occupies itself uh, a lot with prophecy and dealing with issues that should be a concern to us. You know, even the disciples of Jesus came to him, and uh, Matthew records in chapter 24, verse 3, Now as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately, saying, Tell us when these things will be, and what will be the sign of your coming. And Jesus answered and said to them, Take heed that no one deceive you. There is a promise of deception in the Bible, especially with reference to the end time period. Uh, anytime you uh, think of the whole uh, topic of warfare, even in a natural sense, knowledge is power. If you can deceive your enemy, deception is a very powerful weapon. And sadly, there are many who might embrace the idea of the end times. They might be excited about various end time signs that are out there somewhere. But it's interesting to note that when Jesus begins to talk about this, he always prefaces the whole discussion with be not deceives. In verse 11, he goes on and says, Then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. And because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold really emphasizing the fact that this time in which most of us here, or perhaps all of us here, believe we're not just looking at signs that may take place in the future, but we're in the midst of the final age of mankind. Paul, in writing to Timothy, chapter 4 of his first epistle, says, Now the Spirit expressly says in the latter times that some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits, and doctrines of demons. And during these two sessions, we're going to look specifically at uh, this teaching of Paul and unpack it and look at what is Paul talking about, especially when he tells Timothy, the Spirit expressly says in the latter times. In other words, you can't make it any more emphatic than that. Probably should be in all capital letters uh, so that we get, it gets our attention that some will depart from the faith and the, what they will do is they will give heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons. So Jesus warns of false prophets and Paul warns of deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons. We're going to focus on what is this term mean and how can we see in Scripture to make sure that we're not among those who are deceived. Well... A doctrine is simply defined as a codification of beliefs or body of teachings or instructions, taught principles or positions as the body of teaching in the branch of knowledge or belief system. Now, I hope that clears it up for you. <laughs> Don't you love dictionaries? I go there to get something really clear to tell me, just tell me what a doctrine is. The Ron Matson version of that is that a doctrine is a formalized expression of a foundational belief. That's what a doctrine is. It's a way of formalizing it and expressing it so that you clearly understand what it is you believe in. 
Now, in the context of this warning of the Apostle Paul, what are doctrines of demons? Well, they're deception through disinformation. Disinformation. Disinformation is not to be confused with misinformation. Misinformation is when you accidentally say something that's not true. You know, somebody asks you the time and you, you misread your watch and you give them uh, uh, misinformation. It's a mistake. Disinformation is intentional misleading. And deception is all about disinformation. It is the type of information that tries to eclipse truth with pseudo-truth. Something that will appear to be palatable, but in doing so, it eclipses uh, the, the real uh, subject there. And that's a real uh, uh, form uh, that's used within warfare. That's what stealth uh, warfare is all about. Fighting in the night, making your enemy believe you're someplace you're not. And, and it's all about misrepresenting yourself. It really is built on creeds that are counterfeit truths. It's not going to be obvious. In fact, the opposite is true. For it to be deceptive, it has to appear to be truthful. That's the issue here. It's not going to be obvious. What they do is they offer alternative explanations. Or oftentimes, you'll hear this sort of phrase, they're there to correct the errors of the past. How many times have we seen... Uh, the latest and greatest rendition of the life of Christ, correcting the misinterpretations uh, of the life of, the, of Christ in the past, always offering their, uh, their new information under the, under the guise of it being correcting the errors of the past. You know, the first time we see this take place, of course, is in the Garden of Eden. You want to go back to the history of man being deceived by Satan. Let's go right back to Genesis chapter 3. In verse 1 we read, Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord had made. And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. Then the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die. For God knows in the day in which you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. And so we look at that first time that mankind is deceived. Let's look at the method of the deception, because one thing is for sure. The New Testament tells us concerning Satan that we don't have to be ignorant of his devices. If you understand his MO, modus operandi, if you understand that from a careful study of Scripture, you can begin to see the patterns that he uses to deceive. And so he always starts with a question. He says, has God indeed said? Let's, let's create a little doubt there. And then that leads him to where he's able to offer a contradiction. You shall not surely die. Now she doesn't... Uh, totally or faithfully uh, give a uh, rehearsal of, of what the command of God was, but that's immaterial at this point. He doesn't argue with her. He just simply contradicts her and says, no, 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 that, that's not going to happen. And then he concludes with a whole new revelation. God knows in the day that you eat thereof, you will be like God. Wow, that really moved the marker, didn't it? And that's Satan's method, is to begin, in a sense, questioning the Word of God. Let's move away from the Word of God, and let's deal with what you feel like. Because, of course, you know what the Genesis account records for us, of course, is after uh, Satan approaches her this way, she took a second look at the tree and saw that it was pleasant to look at and would make good food. You see, she, she moved out of the realm of being obedient to the Word of God and began to make decisions based on how she felt about what was being sent to her. And that'll be a key thing we need to be aware of when we're dealing with this issue of spiritual deception. You need to literally park your emotions. 
If you don't do that, you are really opening yourself up to a minefield where you won't be able to determine what is of the Lord and what is not because you're allowing your, your flesh to govern over your spirit. Now, what Christian doctrines would Satan wish to confuse today? Obviously, there in the garden, Satan was after Eve to convince her to transgress against the simple one commandment of God. Well, Paul gives this warning to the Corinthian church. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, beginning in verse 3, Paul writes, But I fear lest somehow, as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, so your minds may be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he who comes preaches another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if you receive a different spirit, which you have not received, or a different gospel, which you have not accepted, you may well put up with it. Now notice what Paul does to this church in Corinth. He points to a chilling parallel. He says, as the serpent deceived Eve. How did he do it? He did it by taking her away from an obedience to the word of God and brought her into a place where she was making a judgment based on her feelings. How do I feel about this? And so often in the spiritual realm, people are opening themselves up to air because they are elevating the sense of their own intellect and feeling about that. Well, it just didn't feel wrong to me. It just The Holy Spirit just seemed to really be this or that, or that truth, or that person said this, or this took place. Whoa, dangerous place to trust our feelings in those incidences. So he points to this parallel as the serpent deceived Eve, Paul warns of three deceptions they may well put up with. What a sad indictment for the church in Corinth. He says, you might put up with another Jesus, or a different spirit, or a different gospel. John makes this declaration in his first epistle, recognizing that, Paul, or that John wrote his first epistle to combat, really, the, the Gnostic heresy the, the reinterpretation of Jesus that was happening in the first century. The person and character and deity of Jesus Christ was already being dismantled, interestingly enough, within the seminaries. Not on the street. It was taking place in the, the monastery of Alexandria in Egypt and places like that. They were dismantling the simplicity that was in Christ. And John makes this declaration, Who is a liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ? He is an antichrist who denies the Father and the Son. Whoever denies the Son does not have the Father either. He who acknowledges the Son has the Father also. John recognized, as he is writing this epistle, that the issue of Jesus Christ is really the biblical theological line in the sand. It really is the, the litmus test. It is the, the defining doctrine that was under attack. And so what was being attacked at that time was whether or not Jesus Christ literally came. The Gnostic heresy, you know, wanted to, to, they borrowed from Eastern dualism, where if something was truly pure and holy, it couldn't occupy a physical body, because the physical universe is fallen. So how can someone who is holy occupy something that's fallen? And so they start with a question, and you go, oh, that's a good point. How could something holy <coughs> occupy something that's fallen? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. Well, what's your solution to that? Well, the Jesus that walked the earth was just an aura. He would walk on the beach and there wouldn't be a footprint and so on and so forth. And they, they took away the humanity of Jesus Christ. Well... He goes on in his second epistle, verse 7, he says, For many deceivers have gone out into the world who do not confess Jesus Christ as come in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. When we consider 
This term that we use so freely, especially in prophetic terms, to point to an individual, John uses it to really create a category of people who want to offer a pseudo-Christ, an alternative Christ. You know, we go, so who do you, what do you think about the Antichrist? That is one of many titles that we, we give this son of perdition that the Bible tells us about. Uh, who will be a dominant feature in the end time scenario. But the term Antichrist, oftentimes John's the one that's using it, and he's using it to really talk about a class of people who get there by virtue of their understanding and their presentation of who Jesus Christ is. That they're an Antichrist. You see, not everyone who names the name of Jesus means the same person as revealed in the Bible. Now, there would be no one, I would believe, in this room who would say, no, I disagree with that. In, in summary, I think we can all accept that. But I'm going to take you now through what is being said about Jesus Christ by so many other religious organizations and religious thinkers. Let's talk about the Muslim Jesus. This is taken from a book called The Muslim Jesus. Jesus' true name, according to the Quran, is Isa. His message was pure Islam, surrender to Allah. Isa's original disciples were also true Muslims, for they said, we believe, bear witness, that we have surrendered, we are Muslims. So you didn't get that in your New Testament, did you? Isa's mother is Maryam, was the daughter of Imram. She was the sister of Aaron and Moses. That's different. While still a virgin, Miriam gave birth to Isa alone in a desolate place under a date palm tree, not in Bethlehem. Isa spoke while still a baby in his cradle, and later he also foretold of the coming of Muhammad. Although Christians believe Isa died on a cross, and Jews claim that they killed him. In reality, he was not killed or crucified, and those who said he was uh, crucified lied. Issa did not die, but ascended to Allah. On the, resurrection, on the day of resurrection, Issa himself will be a witness against Jews and Christians for believing his death. Christians and Jews could not be freed from their ignorance until Muhammad came bringing the Qur'an as clear evidence. Muhammad was Allah's gift to Christians to correct misunderstandings. Wow. Okay, I think I've heard that somewhere. Uh, again, you're going to see Satan is very unoriginal. He will do the same thing over and over and over again. Let's go to the Mormon Jesus. Again, you'll notice the references that are here. You can check them out for yourself. These are all from their documents. The birth of the Savior was as natural as the births of our children. It was the result of natural action. He partook of, partook of flesh and blood, was begotten of His Father, as we were of our fathers. Christ was begotten by an immortal Father in the same way that mortal men are begotten by mortal fathers. Jesus is the literal spirit brother of Lucifer, a creation. That's good stuff, hey. He earned his own salvation while he was on earth. He offers his grace only to those who work hard enough. He is finite. He must submit to a moral law that existed before he did. And you can one day become just like him. That's Mormon theology concerning Jesus Christ in a nutshell. It disturbs me when I consider the fact that um, there are those, even within the Christian church, who would be so quick to embrace uh, popular Mormon politicians or radio talk show hosts or whatever and invite them into their churches to speak on their pulpits. When in fact, when you study the Jesus Christ that the Mormons present is not any way, shape, or form a representative of the Jesus Christ that the Bible gives us. But confusion. People are, are deceived. <coughs> the Jehovah's Witness Jesus. 
The Son of God was known as Michael before he came to the earth. War broke out in heaven. Michael, who is the resurrected Jesus Christ, and his angels battle with the dragon. In the Jehovah Witness version of the Bible, John 1.1 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was a God. They believe in a duplicity of God, only a lesser God. That is the word uh, a powerful God-like one is how they would interpret that one inserted letter uh, a. Clearly, Jesus is not Almighty God. The Watchtower publication teaches that Jesus returned invisibly and began to rule in heaven as king in October of 1914. So the second coming has already taken place. It took place in a secret room. And so that's what the Jehovah's Witness believe. So when that person comes and knocks on your door and says, I believe in Jesus, and you go, oh, I do too. No, they believe in Jesus, who was formerly Michael the archangel. And, uh, and he's just a first, he was the first creation of God. Oneness Pentecostal Jesus. Oneness theology denies the Trinity and teaches that God is a single person who was manifested as the Father in creation and as the Father of the Son and in the Son for our redemption and as the Holy Spirit in our regeneration. So it's the continual evolution of God. So in creation we have the Father, in the, and then the Father becomes the Son and dwells upon the earth. So I don't know who is speaking from heaven when John is baptizing Jesus, where it says, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. But nonetheless, that's the position that, that um, how, and, and if you know anyone that's, that's from this sort of a background, the Pentecostal holiness or the oneness Pentecostal group, they will begin with a question. How can God be a single God be in three persons? That's illogical. Let me offer you a better solution to correct your misunderstanding about the person of Jesus Christ. And you're going, I, I, I've been here before. I've, I vaguely remember somebody else saying, hath God indeed said? Yes, God indeed has said. Continue, therefore, Jesus is just another manifestation of Father God. Let's deal with the Catholic Jesus. Jesus Christ is truly God, the second person of the Trinity, the Son, the eternal Word, who with the Father and the Holy Spirit always was, is, and always will be. So far, so good. Jesus Christ is truly man because uh, He has the nature of man having a body and soul. Jesus was not always man, but became man in the womb of the Virgin Mary. And here is where we need to understand that's as far as Roman Catholicism doctrine will take you concerning the person of Jesus Christ. They'll speak of His death and resurrection, but we'll, we're going to tag on here the additions to this. The additions is all around the Virgin Mary. Mary is the all-holy, ever-virgin mother of God. Now, I'm going to make references to the Catechism of Catholic, the Catholic Church. This is, their, this is their basis of doctrine. All right. The queen over all things, our advocate, helper, benefactress, and mediatrix, who is full of grace, the mother of God, and our mother. She had no original sin and never committed sin. She is second only to her son and sits on the right hand of majesty on high. She sits on the throne with Jesus. In fact, no man goeth to Christ but by his mother. So you, you see the definition of Jesus, the Roman Catholic Jesus, you have to include the doctrine of Mary because you cannot get to Jesus unless you go through Mary. It was Mary who crushed the poisonous head of the most cruel serpent and brought salvation to the world. It is she who delivers our souls from death and continues to bring us the gifts of eternal salvation. So 
according to Catholic theology, your salvation is established and maintained not by Jesus Christ as the author and the finisher of our faith, but Mary. Mary, by her spiritual entering into the sacrifice of her divine Son for men, made atonement for the sins of man. Having suffered for the church, Mary deserved to become the mother of all the disciples of her Son, the mother of their unity. In fact, Mary's role as co-redemptrix did not cease with the, with the glorification of her Son. The Roman Catholic Jesus is a co-redeemer with his mother Mary. It's important you understand this. I have so many Christian ministers who will say to me, oh, well, yes, you know, Roman Catholics are born again. They believe in Jesus just like we do. I, I'm sorry. Read their own documents. Read their own documents. Don't read what people say about them. Read their own documents. Their own documents are, are without question. The Jesus Christ that the Roman Catholic Church teach is a, is a son of one who was ruled by his mother, who is a co-redeemer. She suffered with him. She suffered with him on the cross. It gets worse because Christ, our Redeemer, said it was truly His body that He was offering under the species of bread. It has always been the conviction of the church of God and His holy council now declares again that by the consecration of the bread and the wine there takes place a change of the whole substance of the bread into the substance of of the body of Christ our Lord, and of the whole substance of the wine into the substance of His blood. This is referred to as the doctrine of transubstantiation. Now, I've been in ministry a long time, and pastored churches for many, many years. And the number of times people will come to me and say, oh, we need to, um, I, I've, I've met this born-again Catholic priest and I will say, well, then why is he still in the Catholic Church? If he's born again, why does he, at each Mass, which is the reenactment of the crucifixion and the act of taking the bread and the wine at every Mass and, and um, offering it as the literal body and blood of Jesus Christ? You cannot be in the priesthood and not believe that. Well, if you believe that, how can you be a born-again Christian? Now, I know that th these kinds of statements are going to do nothing but get me in lots of trouble. But I think it's time for people to just be aware of what's there. It's another Jesus. Not to judge by sense or by taste, but to grasp the truth by faith. And so be fully assured without misgivings of the Christ's real presence under the veil of bread and wine. Don't worry about what it tastes like or what your senses tell you. As you take that wafer and place it on your tongue, that is literally the body, the flesh of Jesus Christ that has been, been, been um, uh, transformed before you. And that's why... Holy Communion, as they call it, is so important within the Roman Catholic Church. When the lead actor in the uh, Mel Gibson film, uh, the, Passion, the Passion of the Christ, uh, being a Roman Catholic himself like Mel Gibson, when the film was being made, admitted that in order for him to play that part, he needed to eat the flesh of Christ throughout the day so that he could be Christ constantly having to take communion because he wanted to be as close to the person of Christ by eating his flesh. That's paganism. That is paganism. It's another Jesus. Probably one of the best books written on this subject about the Roman Catholic Jesus is the book by Roger Oakland and Jim Tetlow called Another Jesus. 
uh, probably the best work in, in collecting uh, way more than I have here. I just gave you a brief skim of that, but a great resource um, and uh, uh, would highly recommend that you get that in the sense that we are arming ourselves with understanding. Please don't misunderstand even the objective of this study is not to give you little snippets so that you can go out and, and uh, make snide remarks to the, to the Muslim who believes in Isa, whose mother was the sister of Moses. They obviously have trouble with, with time scales, but, um, or, Mo, or Moses' sister lived an awful long time. But, but you under, or, or, the, or the Mormon Jesus, or the Jehovah's Witness Jesus. I'm, give, I'm, I'm giving you this so that you can be equipped so that you won't be deceived when somebody begins to tell you, it's all the same, isn't it? We all believe in the same God. And after all, they believe in Jesus. It's a different Jesus. The next Jesus, the Hollywood Jesus. You know, we, we point our finger at a lot of religious institutions, but probably more damage has been done by Hollywood to the cause of understanding who Jesus is than, uh, than, than what, what, what the, the media has done. Cecil B. DeMille's King of Kings in, the 1920, in 1927 to Jesus Christ Superstar, that rock opera uh, where the music written by Andrew Lloyd Webber, uh, to The Passion of Christ. Mel Gibson said in an interview he was astonished that the Protestant church accepted the movie and made it such a popular hit because he intentionally made it overtly Catholic. He was astonished that it became such a huge hit. It became a hit because most Christians that watched the film were completely ignorant to the fact that it was written from um, a, a, a document from a mystic, a nun that was a mystic who had visions of the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. And what that does is when you misrepresent the person of Jesus Christ, that image, that misrepresentation, that misinformation is what resides. Not the truth. It eclipses the truth. Now, I'm not saying that we can't look at these things, enjoy, you know, or, 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 or get some, some uh, entertainment value from them. I'm not talking about that. What I'm saying is they are another Jesus it's another Jesus. There are the cults Jesus, and we'll go quickly through these just to give you a sense of that. Edgar Cayce, he was a, a 20, early 20th century American psychic. Edgar Cayce said this concerning Jesus, He's an example for man and only as a man, for he lived only as a man and he died as a man. Christian science. Jesus is not God, as Jesus himself declared. But he is the Son of God. Church universal and triumphant, Jesus was both the actual and symbolical representative of this Christ self. Un unpack that, if you would. Jesus was the example, the one who self-realized the Christ mind and was at one with it all at all times. So he was at one with it. Something that was greater than Christ was called the it. A misrepresentation. Christadelphians. Perhaps you've run into Christadelphians. Jesus is a man, not God. He was the Son of God, and salvation requires acceptance of Christ as Lord and Savior. Christadelphians believe that since Christ died, He cannot be God because God cannot die. Notice the logic there. Christ died. Well, we know God can't die, so how can Christ be God? Hath God, said it, hath God indeed said? That doesn't make sense, does it? I mean, use your logic. Yeah, that is kind of crazy. How can God who is eternal die? Yeah, that makes sense. Well, that's the basis of their theology concerning Jesus Christ. The Masonic Lodge. Oh, there's lots that we can say here. Freemasonry carefully excludes the Lord Jesus Christ from the Lodge and chapters, repudiates His uh, mediatorship, rejects his atonement, denies and, and disowns his gospel, frowns upon his religion and his church, and ignores the Holy Spirit. The Unification Church. 
the Reverend Sun Young Moon. It is a great error to think Jesus was God himself. Jesus is no different from any other men. Unitarians do not regard him, that is Jesus, as, superna- as a supernatural creature. The literal Son of God who was miraculously sent to the earth as a part of an involved plan for the salvation of human souls. I mean, they go out of their way to make sure that their followers understand Jesus is not the source of your salvation. Well, if He's not the source of their salvation, then why bother to tell me He's not? As a, as a plank of my doctrine. You see, if there is something that is not true... I don't need to make it one of my foundational beliefs. I do not believe that Father Christmas lives at the North Pole. And I'm going to make sure that it's in my statement of faith. I mean, how ridiculous. I mean, it's, I don't need to make a statement about what I don't believe. I make a statement about what I believe. But in the basis of Unitarianism, they want to make sure that you understand that they do not regard him as a supernatural creature. The Divine Life Society, uh, Integral Yoga Institute. They love long names. Remember that Christ is, is not a person. It's an experience, Christhood, like Nirvana or Buddha. It's an experience. So let's just move the historic person of Jesus Christ way off the weird scale into he is nothing. He's an experience. That's who Jesus Christ was. Buddhism, the doctrines of the divinity and the resurrection of Christ are outside the providence of rational thought. Christians are like are schizophrenic. Right, okay. Transcendental meditation, good old Maharishi Mahesh Yogi. When Christ said, be still and know that I am God, he also meant be still and know that you are God. Isn't that nice? So we're, it's all a matter of the way in which we perceive ourselves, Because as we perceive ourselves, we can also perceive Christ. And as we perceive Christ, we can also perceive ourselves. How about that for pretzel logic? But people buy, in, buy the tens of thousands. So when you have somebody who say, yeah, I believe in Jesus. What Jesus? Unity School of Christianity. Now, there's a nice name. Most of our religious beliefs are based on the erroneous idea that Jesus is the only begotten Son of God. So they're going to unify Christianity, and the way they do it is by saying that the the, uh, uh, beliefs uh, about Jesus being the only begotten Son of God is erroneous. So they, again, start with a disclaimer concerning Jesus Christ. The Way International. We, as well as Jesus Christ, were with God in His foreknowledge, but not in existence. Before the world began, neither did Jesus Christ. Now, did you understand that? No, I didn't either. But nonetheless, you see, let's, if you just say things, ultimately, to disqualify the person of Jesus Christ. He's the subject of the attack here. Scientology. There's a word religion if you ever want to study Scientology. You hook yourself up to a machine which tells you how clear you are. It's a, quite a racket. Here's what they have to say. L. Ron Hubbard says, Neither Lord Buddha nor Jesus Christ were OTs. That is, Operation uh, Theotons. Enlightened beings. According to the evidence, they were just a shade above clear, that is, relatively low on the scientific, uh, Scientology scale of spiritual advancement. There you go. So they have a meter that you can hook yourself up to to get clear. And, and both Lord Buddha and Jesus, they were kind of low on that scale. A lot of ho- By the way, a lot of Hollywood actors and actresses are into Scientology. Because they believe that somehow they can improve themselves up to a point to where they can reach ascension. It's a, it's a weird sort of a deal. But this is the, the misrepresentation that's out there. 
And I could go on and on and on, but I'm trying to give you a taste of the fact that we live in the age of deception. And the primary deception is to deceive people with regards to Jesus Christ. That's why it's important that you repair your own ignorance concerning who Jesus is so that you don't find yourself struggling when someone asks you, so who do you think Jesus is? Well, he's just my Lord, my Savior. He makes me feel good. And the Buddhist can say, wow, you know, or the Scientologist can say, of course, he was a little low on the, on the L. Ron Hubbard scale, you know. <laughs> you get my drift. Be able to give an answer for who Jesus Christ is. Study the scripture. Understand who he is and what he did. It changes everything. It clarifies everything. We have this warning from Jesus again in his teaching in Matthew chapter 24, beginning in verse 23. If anyone says to you, look, here is the Christ or there, do not believe it. For false Christs and false prophets will rise and show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. See, I have told you beforehand, therefore, if they say to you, look, he is in the desert, do not go out, or look, he is in the inner, inner rooms, do not believe it. Jesus is already telling us how we should react. When people come along and say, I've got a new definition for Jesus, you should be hitting that big red button that big X to say, sorry, not interested. The full revelation of Jesus Christ is in the Word of God. I don't need to go to any other source. There's no lost gospel that's going to give me some new insight into how many wives Jesus had. And that his real genealogy are the monarchs in England, you know? I mean, for heaven's sakes. Why is there so much deception regarding Jesus? Well, as Peter stood up before the Sanhedrin, as recorded in Acts chapter 4, starting in verse 9, in defense of the fact that God used him to, to, to heal the lame man, he says, If we this day are judged for a good deed done to, this, to a helpless man, by what means he has been made well, let it be known to you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man stands here before you whole. This is the stone which was rejected by you builders, which has become the chief cornerstone, nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. That's an answer and a half, isn't it? Just so that they would understand the person that you are upset about because you've seen this miracle take place. This miracle took place because of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. I can imagine him just really belaboring the point, you know. The one you crucified. As we begin to define who it is that we're representing here. Let's be clear. Let's stay out of the murky fog that's happening in the world today where, where, there's, where uh, there's almost a fear of defining things in precise terms. We should be diligent about being precise and then holding to that because we are already in the age, I believe, of deception concerning Jesus Christ. And that's why it's so ever so important that as we take the responsibility that all of us have to go into the, all the world and preach the gospel, we have to be equipped with the fact that the name Jesus is not going to be something that's new in the hearing of most people. But the biblical Jesus is the unknown God to them. They won't know. So what? I've heard of this Jesus. Isn't he the brother of Lucifer? Doesn't he live next to the star Kolob as the, in the center of the Milky Way galaxy? They actually tell you where he lives, where his throne is. Kolob, it's a star in the, near the center of the... You didn't know that. Okay, well, check that out. No, we need to not just only know what they know, but we need to know 
what we should know concerning Jesus Christ so that we can be as precise as Peter before the Sanhedrin, who were the religious leaders of the nation of Israel. He schooled them. He told them, that man whom you crucified, it is by that man that this man stands before you whole. And oh, by the way, he's the stone that the builders rejected. Oh, by the way, there is no salvation except by this man. In our next session, we've done another Jesus. We're going to look in our next session at another spirit. And and again, that is a real dangerous area, uh, but we'll deal with that in our second session. So let's bow our hearts in prayer. Lord, we're so grateful that you have gone to such uh, a great extent, extent, Lord, to reveal to us all that's necessary for us to know who you are. Lord, we don't have to uh, ponder uh, these quirky concepts that come out of the hearts of men uh, that have been inspired by your enemy. Lord, pray for each and every one of us here, Lord, that we would come to know you more and more. Lord, that uh, your spirit would open your word to us more and more so, Lord, we could be like Peter before the Sanhedrin, clearly articulating the person in whom we have placed our trust and for whom we are eternally grateful. For it's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen.